Do you consider yourself to be a two-channel purist who prefers to listen to music alone in the dark and relish in the deep, dark, vast abyss of music that you have collected over the years? Or do you consider yourself a home theater enthusiast, somebody who loves action, popcorn, lights, and effects with friends and family? Or are you like me, somebody who likes a little bit of both, but maybe with less hair? Well, in an ideal world, there really would be no difference. Your home theater speaker would work just as well for two-channel listening as it would the other way around. But in the real world, that's just not the way things go. The real problem begins when you try to increase additional output, which is a need for most home theater enthusiasts. Now, certainly there are two-channel audio file types who love louder systems and I'm one of them. But when you really try to break things down and look at the components that make a hi-fi system versus a home theater system, this is what I've come up with. So this is actually the second time I created this video. The first time it was a total car wreck and I decided to help me pace myself a little bit more and maybe to keep things from being a little bit too disjointed. I would create a PowerPoint slide. Yeah, I know it's, it's like it's like work, right? Nobody wants to look at PowerPoint slides, but I promise you we'll all benefit from me having done this. Before we splinter off and actually start stepping through the slide, let's take a swing over to my home theater room where I'm going to give you a, a brief, as brief as I can, an overview of the metrics that I'm going to be talking about in this discussion. Personally speaking, I can read stuff all day and it really just doesn't sink in until I'm able to see it or visualize it or you know get hands on with it. So that's what I'm going to do real fast. I'm going to kind of make this a quick intro, but I do encourage you to watch my previous series of videos about understanding the measurements and I'll put it up in the card and I'll try to make sure I link it in the description down below. So what we're going to start off with is I've got a pair of stereo speakers right now. Now I'm going to move this speaker over here in the center. So it makes it a little bit easier to understand what I'm talking about. Normally when you have your, your setup, you have, first of all, the on axis response, and that is the direct sound. So again, let's imagine that you are sitting right here in the primary listening position. You've got your speaker aimed toward you. Now I've got this one flipped upside down. Those of you who are wondering, this is the tweeter right here. And I wanted my ear to be at the tweeter axis because otherwise you get a droop in the mid range response. So my ear will be aligned with the mid or with the tweeter axis. And that is the on axis sound. It's just the first sound coming right toward you. It doesn't go anywhere else. That is direct sound. Then the next step you have is what is called the listening window that involves the on axis sound and then plus or minus 30 degrees off to the side of the speaker. So not quite all of the speaker, not all the radiation from the speaker, but a smaller window of about plus or minus 30 degrees onto the side. Then you have a smaller vertical window like this gator mouth that's about plus or minus 10 degrees so a little bit up and a little bit down but not much and the reason you have a listening window is that's supposed to be more i guess indicative of how most people are probably going to hear the sound because getting dead on axis with a speaker is tough to do especially when it's a large speaker and maybe you can't get your ear at the exact right height or trying to tow it in is a little bit tough for for any number of reasons so that's why we had the listening window response. Then next up is the early reflections response. And this is where things are really crucial to understand. Early reflections is basically the front portion of the speaker. So the frontal hemisphere, the sound coming out of the front of the speaker all around to the horizontal side. So zero degrees to 90 degrees this way, zero degrees to 90 degrees this way. So the horizontal sound that comes out hits this wall over here, bounces off and comes over here. Those are called your first reflections because they are the first ones to hit a wall or hit a surface and then come back to you in the city position. Vertically, you do have a smaller window. It's a little bit larger than the listening window, but it's still a little bit smaller than the entire frontal hemisphere. I don't remember the exact numbers now, but it's a small portion going up toward the ceiling and a small portion going down toward the floor and then you get a reflection off the ceiling, that's called your ceiling bounce. You get a reflection off the floor, that's called your floor bounce. Now, 
ideally you want all of those reflections to sound the same or as close to the same as that initial on axis direct sound same thing for your listening window you want all of those responses that are coming at you first and you want the reflected sounds that are bouncing off the walls and coming at you you want those to sound the same because if they don't then you can imagine that you would have a a coloration of the sound so let's say for example um, you have good mid-range quality coming out of the front of the speaker but you have bad mid-range quality going to the sides and then it's reflected back to you and that is what we talk about when we talk about directivity the early reflections directivity index is just it's a difference of the listening window response so that smaller little window of response up and down and side to side versus the broader side to side and the broader up and down response so you take those two you take the difference and any difference there really ideally if it were a completely omnidirectional speaker spreading sound throughout the room in the exact same way throughout then you would just break even that'd be a zero right but ideally what we're looking for in the early reflections is a smooth line right and any deviation you have from that line indicates a deviation in response between the listening window and the early reflections response i will also note that the early reflections does include a wall bounce behind the speaker but you can pretty much consider the front of the speaker the main portion and the main contributor to the early reflections now the early reflections is considered the most important metric in sound quality accuracy and it's important because as i mentioned a minute ago when you have the reflected sound, if it sounds different from what you're hearing as your direct sound, then that's gonna change the tonality or the timbre, uh, the overall sound signature of what you're hearing. That can also play a role on the imaging as well. So you could have smearing and things like that of instruments and the sound stage. So for example, if you're listening to a track with a saxophonist right here, well, he may not sound exactly right here. He could wander a bit from side to side. And that is also due to in part uh, of the early reflections response versus the on axis response so again ideally what you're wanting is you want the early reflections to mimic as closely as it possibly can the on axis response and there is a discussion that we can have at a later time about how much do you want it to mimic that gets into the discussion of the directivity index value how flat the directivity index is going across the x-axis or how upright it is going across the x-axis now the more flat it is the more omnidirectional a speaker is that means that it's playing a point source 360 degrees around it but the more linear it is or the more sloped it is that means that as you go higher in frequency it's becoming more and more directional so you can start off at the low frequencies typically with the omnidirectional sound that is spread throughout the room so let's say about 400 hertz or so everywhere in the room is pretty much affected the same but as you begin to go higher in frequency you start to narrow up that radiation pattern and the higher frequencies become more directional and there is less energy sent to the side walls and the rear walls and the floor and the ceiling but again we're going to save that for a different topic at another later date because that that's going to get this one too far off track but anyway i hope that little bit of a crash course helps give you a better understanding of what I mean when I say on axis, listening window, and early reflections and directivity index, because these things are crucial to understand as we get into this next portion of the conversation. Okay, so now we are back and we are gonna flip through some slides and I'm gonna talk about some of these metrics that we just discussed. Now we're going to talk about them and show you why they're applicable to you either in the home fi realm or the home theater realm. Now the first set of slides that I have up right now is gonna be dedicated to the two-channel purist. And this is what I deem as requirements for a two-channel purist. You want linear on-axis response and you want a good, smooth, linear listening window response. Bass extension, ideally, you know it would be 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, but most people that I find based off of doing these reviews and all the information that I get back, they tend to be happy with 40 to 50 hertz F3 anechoic response. So in other words, it doesn't have to play all the way down to the subwoofer levels. It can play down into the 40 or 50 hertz region anechoic because when you put that into a room, you get a little bit of room gain, a little bit of boundary gain, and that helps bring up that low end a little bit more. Also combined with there's, I won't say there's not a lot, but it's more common to find music that 
has bass rolled off below 40 or 50 hertz. So there's not as much content in that lower region for the majority of genres. And certainly there are exceptions, but again, we're speaking in generalities. Smooth early reflections directivity index. As I said before, if you don't have this, then you will have some timbre mismatching going on between what you hear coming directly at you versus what is reflected off the sidewalls. Now, directivity really matters when you start talking about multiple drive units. Let's say, for example, you have a speaker with a tweeter and a mid-range. Probably going to be okay in terms of horizontal directivity. Probably going to be a little bit off in vertical directivity if you've got the tweeter up here and the mid-range down here. If you have a speaker that has multiple mid-ranges or multiple mid-bass drivers, well, the further those drivers are spread apart this way or that way, is going to dictate the radiation pattern of that speaker. And it's probably going to have a directivity index that suffers. Output is not as important in the two channel listening realm as it is in the home theater. And I say that because most people based on, again, anecdotal information that I get back from listeners and people who watch my videos and read my reviews, they tend to tell me that when I mention that I listen to 85 to 95 dB or something, you know, on the louder end, they'll say, well, that's too loud. I'm usually between 70 to 80, uh, 75 to 85, 65 to 75. So boiling that down, generally speaking, I find that audiophile types generally, again, don't listen to music as loud as home theater types tend to listen to their playback systems. Now, requirements for the home theater enthusiasts higher output. Now this is again, a generality, but I find that most home theater enthusiasts are listening between the 75 to 85 decibel region. And these are average output. This isn't including transients, dynamic peaks. This is just average listening levels. And that is typically at a little bit of a further seated distance than the two channel enthusiasts. With higher output, you need low compression and low distortion. Just like two channel, you want smooth early reflection directivity index. But in this case, you want it for its EQ ability. Now, this is where I find that the biggest difference is probably acceptable in home theater versus two channel. And that is nonlinearity in the on axis and the listening window response. The reason I say that that's not as crucial is because most home theater people by and large, are using equalization. Matter of fact, I recently did a poll. I found that about 80% of my viewership, you, use equalization. That seems to be more geared toward the home theater enthusiasts because there still are a lot of two-channel purists who don't want to use equalization. So that's why I say that home theater doesn't necessarily need as smooth response. You just need good early reflections directivity. And we're gonna talk about reasons for that in a little bit. Another reason that nonlinearities may be okay is because you're focused on the action on the screen. For example, you know, if you go to any movie, you can have distractions in the theater. Sometimes they're really annoying. If you have a low level of anxiety, like I sometimes do when I go to the theater, you'll be worried a bit about the numbskull behind you who won't shut up during the previews. But you find that once the movie starts, even if that person is still yapping a little bit too much, you don't notice it as much because you're focused really on what's going on on the screen. And that's why I say that I find myself and having talked to others that you can handle nonlinearities in the response. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, the, the, the timbre needs to be close to real, as close to real as you could possibly get it. But I think that you're more willing to forgive some of those inadequacies or uh, insufficiencies when you are watching a movie because you're focused more on the action on screen as opposed to turning the projector off or turning the television off and listening intently for that sound. Low bass extension is not necessary out of your main speakers in a home theater. And that's because pretty much all home theaters have subwoofers. So you're directing the low frequency content to dedicated subwoofers. Unlike two channel where they may not use dedicated subwoofers, even though I still contend that every system, realistically, every system could benefit from dedicated subwoofers. And maybe there's a couple rare exceptions, but there's probably very few and far between that couldn't benefit from a true 
low frequency transducer driving all the bass. Now let's talk more about the smooth early reflections directivity index. In this slide, I'm kind of giving you a recap of the regions that define what the early reflections are, as well as the listening window, because as I said before, the difference between the listening window and the early reflections is what gives you the early reflections directivity index. On the right side, you'll see a example of a speaker that I measured early this year, and it's one of the better ones, if not really the most linear on-axis response that I've seen so far, and it really does have maybe even still the best early reflections directivity index shown in this dashed blue line down here. So we're gonna walk through a few examples. I'm gonna show you a good speaker in terms of on-axis linearity and early reflections. I'm gonna show you a bad one, and then I'm gonna show you one that is a little bit of both, but give you a reason why I think that the latter can be used for home theater, but maybe not used for two channel stereo listening. Now, this speaker has smooth on axis and listening window response as defined by the black line and the green dash line. I mean, they're pretty linear, all things considered. You gotta keep in mind the scale here, each bar set is five dB. So this speaker is within about plus or minus one and a half dB through most of the basically about 30 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and that is superb. Now, if we go to the bottom and we look at this dash blue line, that's the difference between the early reflections and the listening window response. And remember earlier I said that you really want that to be as smooth as possible, whether it's a flat line or whether it's kicked up, that, that's up to preference, but you want it to be linear. Also remember that this does take into account horizontal and vertical. Usually what you're gonna find is the vertical drive some little blips, some little deviations in the early reflections directivity index, even when the horizontal response is quite smooth. And that really is the case here. The early reflections directivity index for this speaker is about as textbook perfect as you could hope to get. Short of it being a single transducer coaxial driver, this is about as good as it's gonna get. You will see this little bit of a bump right around the one and a half kilohertz region, and that is so minor that it's really not even worth calling out. But the reason that that is there is because of the vertical distance between the tweeter and the drive unit that's below or the mid range. And if we go to the horizontal response, we can see that the horizontal response is just falling off almost textbook perfectly. So the issue is not in the horizontal plane, it's just vertically, and it's a very, very minor issue. Therefore, this speaker will work perfect for both home theater as well as two-channel listening, and it, and it has plenty of output for home theater as well. This is a speaker with poor on-axis response as well as poor listening window response and poor early reflections directivity index. And we see that by this black line and the dashed green line is just really not quite linear. I mean, if you take a 500-foot view back of it, it doesn't look terrible, but the resonance at about the one and a half kilohertz area really throws off the linearity. And then the treble has some issues going on combined with a boost in the high frequency. Now you think, okay, well, can I EQ that? Well, that's when we go down here to look at the early reflections directivity index and we try to determine, can we EQ that? And by this graphic, this dash blue line, we can tell that probably not. The reason for that is because it's linear through about two kilohertz, and then there's a pretty big jump of about four or five dB, and then it falls back down at about, what is that, four or five kilohertz again. So we have a pretty significant deviation here. Now, if that's due to the vertical plane, we might be okay. So let's see, is it? Looking at the horizontal plane, we can see that no, indeed, what we were seeing with the issues in the directivity index are actually due at least in part to the horizontal response. And the reason we see that is because if we take this bottom response at 90 degrees, if it was linear, it would continue falling on down, but it rebounds at a crossover region, bounces back up, falls back down, bounces back up again. So this is a multi-way speaker that doesn't hold its radiation pattern in the horizontal plane well at all. That means that if you were trying to EQ it, you could EQ one region of it, but it will reflect across all regions of it. Meaning that if I wanted to 
bring down this notch right here, I could do that. I would also do it in the off axis responses too. If I wanted to bring up this notch at 1.5 kilohertz, well, in doing so, I also bring up some nonlinearities off axis. And really what that means is I'm just exacerbating the problem of having an on axis response that does not match the off axis response. So you can't simply EQ that away. You, you're really stuck with a design that is limited uh, in its performance, basically. But this speaker does have a pretty good bit of output. Uh, here's a speaker that I think is a, a really good example of how the data can be twisted and confused and manipulated uh, to give you a story depending on what the story is that you want to tell. And this is really a pitfall of, of some analysts. You know, if, if you're trying to analyze the data and maybe you go into it with preconceived notions or uh, an axe to grind for whatever reason. Let's start with the poor on axis and listening window responses. We can see that they're just kind of bouncing all over the place. And when you get into the higher frequency, I mean, it, it smooths out a little bit, but you still got some issues going on. And right away, you can imagine that this would not be an ideal speaker for two channel listening because it's just not neutral across the board. Uh, it could be worse. I've certainly seen worse, but on a whole, you would have to do some pretty decent EQ to get this thing flat. Well, if you're a two channel purist, you don't have equalization, so you can't get that uh, to tailor to the sound that you want. But if we're a home theater enthusiast, or if you're a two channel enthusiast with equalization, can you EQ the speaker? Well, let's go look down here. This blue line, maybe at first glance, you're thinking, no, you really can't because it's, it's kind of dipping and it's bouncing up. But the dip isn't really as much of a concern. And if you just kind of draw an imaginary line through there, you're probably okay. And then you've got a little bit of a peak, but it's reasonably narrow in Q relative to its amplitude. So its amplitude is about maybe two dB, one or two dB over this magical trend line that I would imaginarily draw through here. And you can see that if you just drew the trend line through here, the early reflections directivity index of the speaker looks pretty darn good. And it actually is a speaker that you could EQ. And if we go look at the horizontal response, it basically just tells us the same story that yes, indeed the horizontal looks quite good. The vertical is what's really throwing things off in these early reflections area. And we can EQ the speaker. This happens to be a DIY sound group speaker. I don't remember what the cost is to build it, but it does come in kit form. I wanna say it's like 400 or 500 bucks for one speaker, you would build it yourself. And I think this is a great example of a speaker that has poor on axis linearity, but really good early reflections directivity. And that means that for two channel listening without EQ, probably not a good choice. But if you have home theater system with equalization or you're a two channel enthusiast and you do have something like a mini DSP or Odyssey or any of those kind of good EQ systems, then you could flatten this speaker right out. You could tweak it and shape it to your own desire. It doesn't have to be flat. It can be tweaked to whatever you want. But the good thing is, is as you're adjusting the on axis response, you are also adjusting the off axis response in the similar fashion. And therefore everything that hits you from the front side of that speaker is also gonna be relayed at you from the side, off the reflection of the walls, and it's gonna to work to provide you with an overall sound that you actually want. Now we're gonna talk about compression output linearity, but we're gonna do this rather briefly because I've discussed this in depth before. I'll throw a link in the card up here, or I'll try to remember to. But basically what this hits on is transients, dynamic range of a speaker. If you're listening to music or a vocalist or you're watching a movie at a lower volume and then all of a sudden something comes on you know, pretty strong, you want the speaker to be able to relay that sense of urgency. And if it can't, then usually it's unable to do so simply due to compression. Meaning that if I have a sound that is 10 dB higher than the sound I'm listening to right now, well, I want my speaker to be able to play that 10 dB louder instantaneously. But if a speaker suffers compression, it may only play five or six or seven dB louder. It won't achieve that full 10 dB swing. And that's what these test results show. And basically every speaker that I've shown you so far is okay in terms of output limitations. But when you start getting into crazy high output, like 102 dB at one meter, which is a pair in a room would be about 92 to 94 dB at four meters, you start to show weaknesses or you start to see signs of weaknesses in these designs. And this is 
generally what I see against all speakers. So a few of them will really do well at the 102 dB region. Uh, most of them do pretty well at 86 and 96 dB. So most of them had a pretty good 20 dB dynamic swing, but fewer of them have 26 dB dynamic range. And the reason I test a little bit further is because I just kind of want to see what the limits are. That's a factor that you really need to consider when you're talking about home theater, because as I said before, most home theater enthusiasts are going to be listening to it a little bit louder on average. And they're also, generally speaking, going to be sitting a little bit further away, which means they're going to, have to turn it up a little bit louder as well. And you want to be able to cover that full dynamic range of your music or your movie soundtracks, your discussion, your dialogue, etc. all the sounds that are going on in the movies. You want to be able to capture that. You want that wince. You want that sound that makes you blink uh, because that's where the goods are, in my humble opinion. A few notables that I'm really not discussing in this video simply due to time. Distortion. You know, I said earlier you want low distortion. Well, what is low distortion? Well, just completely generically speaking. Uh, I generally look at about 3% THD as kind of the mark of, okay, this speaker's starting to kind of run out of steam. Uh, that's a personal choice. You could choose 1%. It really depends on the uh, the content that you're listening to, uh, the order of distortion, and the frequency where that distortion occurs along with the order. So it's not something you can quantify into a single band. I said 3%. That's just something that I generally go off of. If it's below 1%, that's probably going to be completely undetectable in terms of harmonic distortion. Uh, we're also not getting into IMD, intermodulated distortion, where a speaker plays one tone, but also another tone or multi-tone where it plays multiple tones at a time. Uh, generally speaking, I find that the compression and the distortion testing that I do are enough to give you a good idea of what a speaker's system capabilities are. Specific directivity index value. I mentioned earlier that that would really be a conversation for another day. So that's where we're going to leave it. And to wrap everything up, SPL is really the, the big compromiser here. If you want a speaker that has a lot of output linearity, you want a speaker that has multiple drive units. And when you have multiple drive units, then you start compromising on the directivity index, meaning that whereas a crossover is placed, you may have a mismatch in radiation from a tweeter to a mid-range or a mid-range to a mid-base. Or if you have multiple mid-bases or multiple mid-ranges, you have a continuity disconnect there and that creates issues with the direct sound versus the off-axis sound and that really means that it's going to cost you more money to get a speaker that's able to fix those issues because usually the way that's done is by active crossover dsp crossovers or more steep filters in your crossover which means more crossover components and uh, the magnitude of cost just increases a lot to get more components into a crossover network. So I would say generally that if you're looking at budget speakers, let's say a few hundred bucks and they have multiple mid ranges, well, you can probably assume that it's not going to have great directivity. Uh, if you're looking a little bit more, maybe five, six hundred to a thousand and over a thousand, then you're probably getting a little bit safer, but you don't know until you have the data. And certainly you can buy it and try it, but the data helps you make a better educated decision. And that's really what this whole video was about. Directivity smoothness always matters. It doesn't matter if it's just two channel or if it's multi-channel home theater and you've got equalization. Smoothness always matters because in no case do you want the off-axis sound to sound different than the on-axis sound. On-axis linearity and listening window linearity are more crucial for two channel without EQ, but less crucial for systems with equalization for the reasons I discussed earlier. And then the, the underlying thing for all of this is, does the on-screen action take your mind off of the imperfections in your speaker system? I certainly think that it does. Uh, maybe there's research out there to kind of prove the disconnect, but I can tell you from my personal experience and talking with others that that really is the case. And I think this is one reason why some people say, well, I own, you know, A, B, C, or D speaker, and I see your measurements, but I still like it. Well, that could be one reason why. But there's also another multitude of reasons why you may or may not like a speaker that I may or may not like. But again, that's when we look at the data and we try to work through things together to provide us both with a better understanding of what we're seeing and how it's going to relate to what we hear in our listening room. And that's really it. I appreciate you watching and I truly hope you learned something. This video took a little bit more effort than I normally do and it's probably not even going to show, but 
I hope it does. And I really hope that it helps you understand why I'm a proponent of good data, not just any old data, but good data to help us all learn and be better informed of purchase decisions and to understand what's going on in our rooms. Not just to understand the differences between two channel and home theater systems, but really to have a better understanding and appreciation of how to make a better purchase decision. And with all of that said, I am out. I hope you have a good one. Oh yeah, and if you haven't subscribed before, please consider doing that. Hit the like button, that would really be appreciated and uh, we'll talk to you all later. Yeah, I'll talk to y'all later. Peace.